Aloha and welcome to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. This is our December webinar that will be concurrent with a live audience here at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum at Historic Ford Island. Today's topic is the Road to War 1941. Our host and moderator is Lieutenant General Dan Leaf. Hey, thanks, Spin. And since I can call you Spin, you can call me Fig. And you know that, right? Mm -hmm. Aloha. Aloha. Come on, people. We're in Hawaii. Aloha. Thank you. That's a little better. I'm sure those of you online were gave a thunderous uh, Zoom aloha where you are. Uh, welcome to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum on historic Ford Island. And that location is especially germane to today's discussion. Uh, we're really, really lucky to have Dr. Mark Wertman. And I told him I have to be careful. I had a great friend that uh, was a battle buddy during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I was with the ground forces, even though I know I'm an airman, Mark Workman. So mm -hmm. if I make that mistake, Mark, ah. please forgive me. Let me tell them a little bit about you and then you can correct the record. Okay. He's mm -hmm. an author of, of several books. There are uh, even merely the titles are peak interest. Most recently he wrote Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power uh, by y Yale University Press. He's got one on the, um, the Siege of Burning of Atlanta, The Millionaire's Unit, which is um, among the next on my list. He has a distinguished uh, career. His doctorate is in comparative literature. I'll ask you about that in a minute. But the most interesting thing you've done, according <laughs> to my read of your bio, is teaching at a maximum security prison. <laughs> now, I taught at the Army Command and General Staff College as an Air Force major, which was at Fort Leavenworth. It was near a maximum security prison, but not in it. No. What was that about? What was that about? Thank you. Thanks, General. Um, and thank you for coming out and for the people at home turning in, tuning in. Thanks for being here with us. And uh, it's a delight. Um, so. A maximum security prison. So back when I was getting that doctorate in comparative literature, uh, and I, I can say briefly why that feeds into being a historian, um, I, was, uh, I was working on my dissertation and a friend who worked for a community college that ran this program at Rahway State Prison, which is the prison most uh, famous for a program called Scared Straight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she came to me and said, we need a teacher for, uh, for, a college pro uh, for a college degree program that we have at the prison. And I was just crazy enough to say, my God, I don't think I want to work on my dissertation right now. I think I'm going to go teach at a prison. Um, and it actually, I have to say, that I've taught at uh, Princeton, uh, Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. I've uh, spoken at Yale, uh, at multiple Emory University. By far the most inter interesting students, by far the most committed students, and by far the scariest students I've ever taught were at this program at Raw Rawway State Prison. And uh, it's, it has stayed with me ever since. I can tell. And my only time in prison was three and a half years in the Pentagon. So <laughs> you kind of identify. Could we go to the next slide? Because given that that uh, great background, um, we, the, as I said, this is the book that caught my attention, the one, The Millionaire's Unit, yeah. about a bunch of privileged youth who mm -hmm. were early in military aviation when it was at even more dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we may or may not talk about that, but you've written a variety of books. What led you to pen the next slide, please? The book that drew us to you, Fighting in the Shadows, 1941, Fighting in the Shadows, about the road to war. Yep. What was the motivation? Okay, uh, fine question. Um, so going back many years, I had been uh, an editor at the Yale Alumni Magazine, even though I didn't go to Yale, but nonetheless was working there. Um, and I learned about this illustrious 
uh, aviation group that started out as a, a flying club at Yale in 1916. So you're talking about 13 years after the Wright brothers, but it wasn't just a flying club. It was a, a bunch of super privileged kids. So one was a Taft, one was a Rockefeller. Uh, they were uh, descendants of, from the Mayflower. So, uh, one's father was the head of JP Morgan Bank. Another was father was the head of Union Pacific. So super privileged, super uh, uh, wealthy, prominent families. And these kids said the U.S., this was in 1916, the U.S. was not yet in World War I. And they were convinced that the United States was going to end up in the war. And if it did, they wanted to be the first into the fight. And they wanted to fight in airplanes. Now, airplanes, as Fig said, were incredibly dangerous back then. If you went to the front in an airplane, you had an average lifespan of three weeks, you know, and they wanted to go there. And so, and they did. And out of this group came the, uh, all of the secretaries of war and Navy. This was before the Defense Department, right uh, in for aviation, right through World War II, uh, including uh, the secretary of the Navy uh, for air in World War II, who was responsible for developing the, you know, the carrier air force that uh, uh, led the way uh, in the Pacific Island hopping campaign, as well as um, uh, David Ingalls, who came back after being the Navy's uh, first air ace in World War I, came back, rejoined the service, became a rear admiral, and was the head of the Pearl Harbor Naval Aviation Station right here. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, after World War I, there was another generation of Yale students I got in, uh, wanted to understand who did not want to go to war when the U.S. was uh, dealing with Hitler in Germany and with the Japanese and their war in China. And they said the United States should not be intervening in other nations' wars. Uh, these are people like uh, Potter Stewart who later became a Supreme Court Justice. Gerald Ford later became a United States President. Kingman Brewster, who was later Yale's president and ambassador to uh, uh, the United Kingdom. So very prominent young men from very prominent families, exactly like that World War I generation. And yet they didn't want to go to war. And I wanted to understand what had happened, what had changed. And that led to the origins of this mm -hmm. book. And we'll get to that, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, that that road, that very complicated and metaphorically winding road mm -hmm. uh, to war. But we are here on historic Fort Island. It, it's a personal place for me, not mm -hmm. just because I love this museum. And if you haven't been here, people online, you owe it to yourselves. But my uh, mother and father, my father was a Navy ensign, lived on Fort Island mm -hmm. in 1945 or six. I'm not sure which. Forty six, I think. Could have been late 45 but uh right near where we are mm -hmm. and i've been to war a couple times and my daughter has been with me going to war in one way or another we fought from home during the coastal war living in aviano and she was a, a young high school student three miles away from the pentagon when we're, when i was in the pentagon so mm -hmm. she's been through that we served in korea and i remember when she was 10 years old doing her homework um at the christmas at the kitchen table right in the heart of seoul there was a fireworks display probably for the opening of a new apartment house or or a shopping center that came as a surprise at mm -hmm. like seven or eight in the evening and she looked up from her homework and said dad is that the war and i was the deputy director of operations for u.s forces korea so i said no kiddo if it was uh, the phone would be ringing. Now she went back to her homework. I picked up the phone to make sure it still worked <laughs> just to verify that. But there's an even more compelling story in your book mm. about Charlotte Coe. Next story or next slide, please. And Charlotte lived in quarters with her Navy family mm -hmm. um, in view of the Arizona. I, I have to get oriented probably that way, mm -hmm. 100 or 200 yards. Mm -hmm. And she was there, as I said, within view of the Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. When the attack started. 
Yeah. Please tell her story. And yeah, yeah, this is. And let's get some chicken skin about where we are. Yeah, yeah. So, um, courtesy of a of a friend, uh, I was introduced to Charlotte Coe. Now, Charlotte was uh, in 1941, was an eight year old with her brother, younger brother, Chucky, a five year old living with her parents. Her father was the planning officer, number three officer in the uh, in here on Ford Island with the Navy uh, Catalina squadron here flying uh, PBYs. Um, the family lived in quarters on what's called Knob Hill, uh, very uh, adjacent to Battleship Row. They, uh, the kids were what Charlotte called Navy Juniors, uh, and they were free as birds, and this was their paradise. They were, uh, they had the run of the island, except for, uh, except for where the airstrips were, and they would play, uh, they would come down when, sh uh, the, the, Barges would bring in the officers off, off the ships. They would come running down to the dock to meet them. Uh, she knew Admiral Isaac Kidd, who was on, aboard the USS Arizona. He would come down the dock and always bring matchbooks with uh, the embossed uh, uh, ship name on it and pass them out to the kids. You can imagine these... Uh, Twittering kids running around uh, and just not not the app folks Twitter <laughs> not that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so she uh, uh, was with her parents here uh, as well as um, uh, in in the quarters there um, and then uh, they were aware that war was a possibility but. Even within this family, on this island in the middle of, of Pearl Harbor, uh, the possibility of war remained a distant, uh, something distant. The kid, at least for the kids' mind, she told me she had she had such crystalline memories from a, uh, from when she was eight. She passed away uh, about five years ago absolutely elegant, lovely woman. Uh, but she had these memories of that day seared into her. So that, uh, that morning, uh, I'll roll back just a little bit. Her uh, father and mother had gone to have dinner at, at another officer's place. And uh, there was uh, an article published that the, uh, from his uh, memoirs uh, saying, his goodbye to the other officer was, well, let's hope that the Japanese hold off war until after Christmas. So the next morning, uh, and uh, we should say again, they lived within sight of Battleship Row. She would go to bed and she could see the flickering of the movie screen lights from the ships. Um, and the next morning, the first bomb strike. She thought at first it might be uh, dredging up coral in, in the mm -hmm. harbor. And her father was ma busy making the pancakes and he ran in, scooped the kids up. They had practiced this. They ran a hundred yards across uh, a field to where there was an, uh, an empty gun emplacement um, under a house. That had been a play area for them. They called it their dungeon. And they ran into there. They saw uh, a, a Japanese uh, torpedo plane fly by at barely above uh, the level they were, where they could see the pilot uh, with the open canopy. Uh, they ran. They managed to get into this cave structure. Uh, at one point, her brother started running out and shook his fist. His five-year-old kid shaking his fist at the Japanese flying by, and bullets struck around him. Fortunately, he got back into it, into the, or his father ran out, grabbed him, brought him back in. Uh, they stayed there. The father left. As he got back to his house, the Arizona blew up. Uh, he was going into his garage to get the car to drive 
uh, for uh, where he wanted to get to. A chunk of the Arizona blasted through the garage, hit his car. Uh, they didn't see him again for 24 hours. They had no idea what had happened to him. And in the meanwhile, the kids are in this, uh, in this sheltered area and survivors are being brought in. And she saw, you know, these young men, these sailors who were burnt. You know, she had no idea what happens to a body when it gets burnt. And she was witnessing things that no child should ever see. And that the memory was absolutely seared into her mind. So her father had told her the war has started, told mm -hmm. the kids yeah. that the war has started. He'd said to his uh, host at dinner the night before, let's hope they hold off, or that was part of the exchange. So this isn't a surprise. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you can argue that, the, and you do make the point that many did argue, that we were already at war in the fall of 1941. Mm -hmm. Convoys, and, and, and that even years before on the Asian continent, um, so I have to get to the question that somebody otherwise will ask, uh, should we have known, did we know, was this a, a conspiracy by Roosevelt and the administration to just drag us into the war, mm -hmm. or was Pearl Harbor really a, a surprise? Yeah, yeah. Specifically a surprise might be the best way to put it. Yeah. Um, so first, the notion that the president of the United States knew that a, an attack was going to be made on a U.S. military installation and would have uh, uh, opened the door to permit that to happen is uh, it's not only absurd, it's, it's, it's a deeply disturbing and uh, um, bad notion. <laughs> Um, but it's also, and I should say, I asked archivists at the FDR library in Hyde Park, uh, whether people still are looking for the smoking gun mm -hmm. of this. And she said, every week, every week, there are people who come in, going through the papers, trying to find evidence that FDR knew the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. And so, uh, if you say, so for 80 years or almost 80 years, people have been searching for this so-called smoking gun it, and have not found it. It does not exist. There is no direct evidence of that. You know, the reason that people will say, they'll say things like, oh, they saw the smoke coming out of the, uh, out of the consulate. They knew they were burning papers. Um, this they were burning papers. What they knew was that the Japanese had forces on the move and that they were believed to be heading south. Uh, the, the idea of a carrier task force, six carriers with all the supporting ships that would take, would come across 4,000 miles over the Pacific Ocean and launch an aerial assault on what was regarded as the strongest fortress in the world uh, and was to uh, the, uh, the military leadership at the time an impossible concept. There had been one, uh, carriers were typically considered uh, uh, ships that with aircraft to protect battleships at the time. There had been one carrier invasion up till that time, which involved one carrier in the Mediterranean, the, the British attack on the, um, the Italian uh, base at Toronto. Uh, Toronto. Um, so, but what was going on was that FDR was convinced that the United States was going to have to go to war, that we could not remain isolated because isolated in effect meant we would be alone in the world without allies. If the British fell, we would have, we would no longer have that forward barrier, so to speak. Uh, and there was also in 
the Pacific. There was Jap uh, Japan was in an aggressive war, a horrific war in China, attacking civilians, taking territory, and moving to create the same situation that Hitler was moving to create in Germany of what they called the uh, East Asia co-prosperity uh, sphere, which Japan intended to dominate. So given that Roosevelt knew war was inevitable, mm -hmm. right? And let's go to slide six. We'll have a picture of Charles Lindbergh speaking at an isolationist rally. And there were both isolationist and pacifist sentiments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And both of them had their roots in the World War I experience, I think. It's a bit safe to say. But starting with the sinking of the USS Panay in China in 1937, yes. right? Yeah. There, were, there was a lot of war before the war yeah. against the United States. The mm -hmm. attack on the Kearney, the sinking of the Reuben James, the uh, convoys that lost up to 20 ships that were uh, uh, I'm not sure what the flag status was, mm -hmm. but the U.S. was involved, of course, in in supplying Great Britain. Why did it take this? Why did Roosevelt, if he knew this was inevitable, why did it take Pearl Harbor to get us into the war? Is it this? Mm -hmm. Is it countering this part of public opinion? What's what's yeah. the dealio? Yeah, yeah. So. It's a great question, and it's really at the heart of the book. The United States, historically, going back to George Washington, has been had been a neutral nation. The uh, World War I uh, was an aberration. We had never, prior to uh, uh, to uh, World War I, uh, had any kind of direct alliance uh, with other nations, treaty alliances. Um, and after World War I, we re reverted to our uh, historically neutral status. In, and the reaction to World War I, this image of industrial destruction was seared into Americans' minds. The, the level of, of killing that took place, particularly on the Western Front, uh, was really understood to be uh, uh, a catastro catastrophe for civilization. And there was an expectation that the next world war would be very much the same and very much more catastrophic. The United States during the 1930s the Cong Congress passed neutrality acts that actually said the United States cannot send its ships into belligerent uh, lands. It can any uh, munitions that are sold uh, had to be on a cash and carry basis. In other words, there was no credits, no lending of money to belligerents, and the this new this neutral spirit pervaded America. That spirit may have been there, but the world was was moving very rapidly into uh, a state of uh, in which aggressor nations were the pr principal beneficiaries of United States neutrality. As long as the United States didn't get into the, into uh, these wars, you can pick off small small nations as Hitler was doing in Europe until he faced off against uh, another great power of. Uh, Great Britain. In uh, the Pacific, Japan could seek its, uh, could seek uh, colonies of its own and seek to remove the Western powers, uh, which it can consider to be an affront uh, on its status as what it viewed to be the premier power in Asia. Uh, so, but for both American youth and their parents, the idea that we should be going to war to pull the uh, the King of England's uh, irons out of the fire again seemed to them, to most Americans, as uh, completely wrongheaded and potentially sending 
their sons back into the, the hell of the trenches. Well, the great war memories are, and I mean, big wars with large loss of American mm. life are kind of a distant memory. But what lessons should modern Americans, mm. current Americans, I guess, take from that period relevant to the period where we have a war in Europe, mm -hmm. where we're only stirring the cauldron with our arms and the mm -hmm. potential for con a cat conflict on a grand scale in Asia is is that experience in the interwar years of the last century relevant to today yeah yeah um that's a great question let me let me uh give the standard historians uh proviso which is uh i tr i look at the past and i try to understand the past um uh the present and the future are an awful lot harder to deal with and predict than the past is. I can tell you what happened in World War II. Um, but that said, <clears throat> excuse me, the what happened in the run-up to World War II was that the United States didn't arouse itself sufficiently to be able to defeat rapidly a foreign power. And so it was, you needed to have something like the attack on Pearl Harbor to create that national fervor that said, we are going to devote ourselves to defeating these enemies. It's very difficult to arouse a nation if you do not have a direct enemy. Uh, but the lesson coming out of the war was not that disarmament worked, that we should disarm again, but that we needed to deter. And the, what we're seeing both in, uh, the, uh, in regards to Taiwan and South China Sea with China and in Ukraine uh, are some of the lessons of what happens when you don't deter, deter uh, sufficiently, when you don't make it quite clear what the price is going to be for aggression on smaller nations. Uh, and in, you know, God bless the Ukrainians, because the Ukrainians, by their resistance, are telling China that you are not going to be able to go into Taiwan and take it simply and easily. And the price that the Ukrainians are paying is horrible, but they are doing it for us. And in certain ways, it's just like what Great Britain did for us during the first two years of World War II. We don't want to stray too far, but I'm not convinced that that lesson is being fully integrated in Chinese leadership. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a concern, I think. Yep. Failure of deterrence is always very costly. Yeah, yeah. in it, the long run. And it could be, again, but we're bifurcated in our attention to, between Europe and Ukraine and the possible threat. Was it that way? Because although the war started, the first four or five chapters of your book are very Europe centric and mm -hmm. Europe and Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, did we just pivot to Asia? Something we do frequently, by the way, they're you know, periodic. It's like there's a calendar, a, a recurring calendar item. Oh, don't forget to pivot to Asia this year um yeah. did we just pivot to asia on december 7th at, in terms of attention and full awareness of the consequences uh, of japanese actions or are we were were we just trying to look both ways at once okay. so the basic military and political strategy of the united states through the first, through the end of the 1930s into the start of World War II. And we of course have to remember that for the more than two years, World War II was formally underway in Europe uh, before the United States, before Pearl Harbor. But there was big war in, in, in Asia too. It just sure. wasn't part of that. Yeah. And there were two separate, very big conflicts going on in Europe and in China principally. <clears throat> and there were two major 
aggressive powers in Germany, of course, and Japan. So if you're FDR in Washington and you're looking at the world, you're looking, you're saying, uh, my principal threat right now is from Europe because Europe is, uh, the, the Atlantic is our uh, major trading route. Uh, historically, uh, we are cousins with the British. Um, uh, we had talked a little bit about this beforehand. There was also a view of uh, the Japanese as, you know, there was a racist view that said, basically, if we ever get into a war with Japan, we'll win very easily, that the Japanese will be a pushover. Um, and so that it was not, well, there was an understanding that Japan represented the principal threat in the Pacific. Uh, far more pressing from Washington's standpoint was what was emanating from Berlin. And so uh, the United States with that Eurocentric view was moving uh, progressively uh, what was called a neutrality zone. We were officially neutral, but we were engaged in this unneutral shadow war, as I call it in the book, of pushing our Navy out into the Atlantic step by step until there's actually a map. Um, yeah. Seven, I think. Yeah, slide, map, seven. slide seven. Yeah. So this is the map that in July 1941, so we're, we're uh, about six months away from Pearl Harbor, that uh, President Roosevelt tore out of a National Geographic magazine and gave to Harry Hopkins, his envoy, whom he sent uh, to meet with, uh, with Winston Churchill. Eventually he sent him to meet with uh, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union. And he wrote, he drew on it, you can see a pencil line. And that pencil line runs to the east of Iceland and then down uh, uh, along through the Atlantic. And he said, this is our neutrality zone. So the US neutrality zone, we occupied Iceland, a sovereign nation or a partially sovereign nation back then, and had our Navy patrolling all the way out within uh, about 300 miles of the United Kingdom. And we said, this is a zone that the United States has declared neutral and warships that come into it uh, are not allowed to come into it. You know, Inevitably, this was going to lead to a collision. But you also had this problem that we had what was going on in Asia. And the United States had sent its Pacific fleet here to Pearl Harbor, all around us now. Uh, they had uh, previously been based in San Diego. We also had a, a very small uh, Asiatic fleet that uh, was, was in the Philippines, headquartered in the Philippines. Um, and this was designed to be a deterrent for the Japanese. And the basic idea in Roosevelt's mind was, God, let me be able to hold off Japan as long as possible while we prepare and move towards war with Hitler. Well, the Japanese had something else in mind. But in the meanwhile, we had less than a one ocean Navy that needed to cover two giant oceans. And so there was a constant shifting back and forth of ships. Actually, one of the blessings of uh, December 7th was that we had removed several of our capital ships from Pearl Harbor, including an aircraft carrier. Uh, say they were not here when the attack took place, which would have been really devastating to lose even more ships that day. Uh, but you had this balancing act that Roosevelt was constantly trying to figure out how can we do this? And in the meanwhile, the Un United States was still officially neutral. Uh, the American people uh, in right through the spring of 1941 by large, large margins were saying, we do not want American troops fighting this war. And President Roosevelt, when he won his uh, 
uh, third term in 1940, uh, he said, your boys, he promised your boys are not going to go fight a foreign war unless we're attacked. So he, and this was a promise he intended to keep. He was not willing to fire the first shot. He wanted the first shot to come sufficiently from Germany. And as, as you said, Fig, you know, the Kearney was hit, the Reuben James was sunk, but still this was not enough uh, to rouse the American people. And in some ways uh, we could say that maybe President Roosevelt hadn't done enough to rouse the American people. He vacillated. Right. So let's bring it back, bring it back to the island of Oahu and go to slide five. As I mentioned while we were waiting to start uh, in my 15-ish uh, years here in Hawaii, especially as the deputy commander of PACOM and in subsequent lives, if you will, the honorary and official consuls general of various nations, including mm -hmm. Japan, there's a consul general here. Slide five, please are part a huge part of the community in mm -hmm. a po very positive way yeah. uh, the consul general in the consulate of japan was not a positive so we're we have this backdrop of war mm -hmm. and um the 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 acknowledged likelihood that we're mm -hmm. going to at some point be engaged with japan mm -hmm. and yet can we get to slide five ash there we go. This dude, yeah. Takeo Yoshikawa, mm -hmm. is right here doing mm -hmm. a bunch of spying yeah. about the enabled the attack. Tell us about him and and about that <clears throat> that part of the road to war that that mm -hmm. Japan was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in uh, Hawaii, as as all of us know who spent time here, Hawaii is, uh, has a very substantial uh, Japanese uh, population uh, descended from Japan. It also has uh, always had a, a large population of uh, Japanese citizens who were living here, uh, living and working here. Uh, the society has always been heavily integrated. Uh, I think there were 80 something thousand Japan people of Japanese descent or born in Japan who were living in Hawaii uh, on December 7th. The consulate, the Japanese consulate was large. It was uh, very much part of, of Honolulu society, but it was also a hotbed of spies. And uh, this, uh, this is a formal naval aviator former naval aviator. He had to resign from the service, but he knew uh, English. Then he was called back into the Japanese Navy. He was a graduate of Ita, Itahama, the uh, Japanese uh, Naval Academy, a uh, very prestigious part of Japanese military at the time. Uh, and incidentally, uh, the Japanese Navy modeled itself on uh, on the United Kingdom's Navy, the Royal Navy. Uh, and they knew uh, American, uh, American naval policy by heart uh, uh, and very much modeled themselves on it and uh, had, uh, had succeeded in defeating Russia in 1904 with, uh, in, with a, a major surprise attack. And this was a tactic that Japan was preparing for again. Uh, they sent uh, Yoshikawa here. Uh, he took uh, on a false passport. He had studied New English. He had studied American ships to the point where he knew exactly what ship, which ship was which by its silhouette. Uh, and he came to the consulate, and then he has, uh, assumed the identity of General uh, Vice Council uh, Morimura, and began to go out every day spying on US aircraft patrols and on the ships in the harbor, uh, studying their movements in and out of, of Pearl Harbor and the directions that the patrols took. Uh, 
And he would go, he would put on uh, workers clothes and go into the cane fields that sugar cane fields that used to surround Pearl Harbor. Uh, he had a tea house in the Aia Highlands that he would go to at night. He had uh, what he, uh, he had an assumed identity, although I think sometimes this assumed identity was something he actually enjoyed too much uh, of uh, kind of drunken playboy. Uh, and he would end up every night at this tea house, often in, with the company of a, of a geisha. And then uh, he would pretend to pass out. And there was conveniently a telescope overlooking Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor. And he could spy on uh, where the ships were and their movements were. Well, over time, he would get orders telling him to uh, report uh, on first on the movements. But then as uh, in November... Of 1941, he started getting um, orders that came to the consulate uh, telling him, we want you to tell us every day what ships are in Pearl Harbor, where they are, draw maps, and we will get them. Uh, and uh, there would be passenger ships, passenger liners that would come in from, uh, from uh, Japan, and the uh, information would get passed back. Um, uh, or radioed, and uh, there was an awareness that there were spies within the consulate. The U.S., this is more evidence that the United States was not opening the door to attack. The United States was so afraid of sparking an attack that they didn't want to arrest the uh, vice consul or the, the consul general because this could be considered a, a diplomatic breach potentially leading to war. So as I recall from your book, they, they even removed wiretaps yes. on the consulate phones on December 2nd, yeah. 1941, yeah. despite the urgency of the situation. Now I've watched NCIS Hawaii, and I'm surprised that <laughs> NCIS didn't catch them because they're always on to these bad guys. <laughs> um, but one of the things that... Uh, mom whatever name uh, he was operating on under did was provide a report that acknowledged that the battleships didn't have their defensive measures in place, but the carriers were not in port. No. Was there ever, from your understanding and research, was there ever any thought to postponing the attack to catch the carriers on the part, or did that not make it to the Japanese fleet in time? Um, so the, well, there are two, two sides to the answer. One is there, uh, the progression toward the attack was so clockwork, mm -hmm. uh, that there was really no holding it back. Once the, once they had decided, uh, what they called X day would be in what in Japan was December 8th here, December 7th. Uh, there was no holding it back. You have this massive fleet that's come to 250 miles off of, of uh, Oahu, and you can't, that even, even knowing what they knew about the patrols that patrolled to the south and west and not to the north, uh, you, there's a certain element of luck that says you're not going to get spotted. So they hadn't been spotted. They had to. They had to carry out their attack. Postponing it would have been too dangerous for them. The other side is uh, that the the principal ships that were targeted were the battleships. The basic concept in uh, naval affairs at that time was that you were going to have great battles. Uh, uh, between very large battleships that would fire enormous shells at each other uh, over, you know, uh, at that point they could fire about 22 miles. Mm -hmm. So maybe within sight of each other, but barely within, you know, but they would be, it would be the battle of battleships. So I, I have to, are you kidding me? They're attacking Pearl Harbor with carriers. They are revolutionary. They are in the process of revolution revolutionizing 
naval warfare. I, and I understand the attack inertia, the fact that they're, mm-hmm. but the notion that they're still thinking of battleships as preeminent when they've just yeah. supplanted their preeminence with a yeah. carrier attack. Yeah. I we, we want to make sure we get some questions. Oh, we absolutely. already have a couple online. Uh, I knew that this would wind up being less time than yeah. at least you and I wanted, and hopefully than you wanted. But let's go, since we took the road to war and got there mm-hmm. here on December 7th, 1941. Let's go to the final slide, number 14. Uh, the notes and the revisions on Roosevelt's speech, yeah. 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 which even though I was born a little bit after 1941, mm-hmm. like 11 years, this is a speech we many of us of our generation know almost by heart. Mm-hmm. The yeah. changes as I look at this are yeah. really significant. Yeah. Yeah. So would you like to kind of share yeah. your thoughts on yeah. that? And then we'll go to the yeah. open mic Q&A. Sure. Uh, well, first, let me just say about this, uh, this artifact here. Um, at the FDR library, I was uh, on one of my visits there. Uh, the archivist brought out the original of this. This is a, my photograph of the original with President Roosevelt's uh, changes to it, his revisions to it. And as you can see, uh, he changed, um, let's see, it was a, a date which will live in, um, and I'm- In our memory or something, yeah. something benign, yeah. not infant. Yeah, and you know, it was Roosevelt's genius to add these words, you know, he he was, you know, the ultimate patrician. You know, you go go listen to some of his his speeches. Now you hear his voice and you say, well, he talked like that, and uh, you know, had that uh, came from a wealthy uh, uh, one of the great families of the Hudson River Valley. You know, and then of course he had his famous uh, fifth cousin. Um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who had been a president and whom he modeled himself on in many ways. And, uh, but he had a genius for speaking to the fears and worries and concerns of average Americans and uh, explaining things to them. His, uh, when the United States began to supply uh, weaponry to the British and eventually the Russians and the Chinese, under the Lend-Lease program, which started in, in uh, late winter 1941, he called it, uh, uh, a, we are lending them a garden hose to put out a fire. And when that fire, uh, when the fire has been put out, they'll return the garden hose to us. You know, this, he, for the ordinary Americans, they began to be able to understand, oh, you know, what this means and maybe to be able to, uh, accept this idea that the United States would be first the arsenal of democracy, and then that we were carrying on these unneutral acts. Uh, we didn't even mention the uh, uh, the uh, the American Volunteer Group that was sent in secret. They recruited American aviators, sent them in secret to China. Slide eight, please. Uh, to and for for anybody who uh, who gets here to the museum, be sure to see the flying tiger P forty here. Uh, and this is General Chenault, who had been an advisor to Chiang Kai Shek's uh, government, nationalist government in China, and he came and recruited uh, American aviators who were allowed to leave their commissions in the United States Navy and go and fight for the Chinese, um, which is to say we were caught up in this shadow war, doing these acts that uh, that Hitler understood and that the Japanese understood were effectively acts of war, but it was an undeclared war. So with that, it's a perfect segue to our first couple of questions from online viewers. And again, I, I wish we had more time, yeah, but I, that's a good thing. Uh, this is from P- Patricia S, who, F, rather, who says the Japanese had claimed for decades, if not centuries, that Hawaii was part of the Greater Pacific Territory, their Greater Pacific Territory. <laughs> Sounds like the Chinese whatever dashed line. Mm-hmm. It's pretty fungible. Um, 
and it, this is a bit of a question we've already asked, but it still goes to uh, the not being fully prepared for the attack. Should we have been, I'm, I'm going to shift Patricia's question a little bit. Should we have been more prepared for a Japanese attack, not just as an act of war encountering the fleet, but as part of territorial ambitions? Did you mm -hmm. find any Japanese territorial ambitions mm -hmm. about Hawaii in your research? You know, interestingly, no. Um, I, uh, and I can't say that I have had an exhaustive, made an exhaustive study of, of Japanese archives, but the books and uh, more expert people on uh, Japanese policy, there certainly was not any uh, notion that uh, they would come and take Hawaii away from the United States. Hawaii, of course, then was a territory, but it was, uh, as it is now, heavily uh, heavily armed with many installations on it. Uh, and the we talked about Charlotte Co. Uh, at the uh, beginning of the talk um, uh, or conversation. Uh, Charlotte Co.'s mother, while they were sheltering, went up to a Marine guard who was in there with them. And she said, when the Japanese come, I want you to save three bullets. I want you to kill my children and then kill me. And uh, because the expectation was that the Japanese were going to invade. Uh, but that expectation, which was then uh, on the day of December 7th in people's mind, that expectation was not actually in American minds. They didn't think it was even possible. They didn't, uh, uh, Secretary of War, uh, or rather uh, General Marshall, the head of, of uh, the army said, this is the strongest fortress in the world. Nobody is going to be able to invade it and take it. Uh, what was not in their imagination was that somebody was going to attack it from the air. The next question is from Mark S. And I'm going, another thing that will consume my time is checking this book out. He's referring to the Great Pacific War uh, by Hector C. Bywater, an English actor. I think Mark says, uh, Mark S. says it was 1935. My quick Google search mm -hmm. says it was 1925. Mm -hmm. That was apparently pretty prescient about uh, war. How is that novel? regarded today is it seen as a yeah i um foretelling of i guess i i'm i'm not it there were so that novel um and i have to confess i haven't read it but that novel was is well known for having described this war that would include uh an attack on uh, uh hawaii um there were any number of earlier predictions. We talked about uh, Billy Mitchell uh, talking about the possibility in, in the 1920s of an attack on Hawaii. The uh, Our ambassador in Tokyo, uh, Joseph Grew, was warning, warned in January 1941, he said there is talk of an imminent attack that will be made on Pearl Harbor. And he said, I personally discount it. But I needed, he needed to uh, send it over to Washington. He sent message to Washington. The Secretary of State then conveyed it to the, uh, his counterparts in the cabinet and the military. They then went down through the line. And the response that came back was, this is not going to happen. By the, were there to be a, a land amphibious invasion, we would hold it off and uh, would then in plenty of time be able to send uh, aircraft to, to destroy it. We, have, uh, we had many fighters. Uh, and in the meanwhile, uh, the United States was starting to beef up with its B-17s, starting to send them out to um, 
uh, our bases in the Philippines and with the uh, in Wake, uh, with the idea that we were then going to be able to be within sufficient range of Japan that they would never attack because we would then immediately have bombed them. So let me go ask a question of my own, and then we'll open up the floor here. What do you think now, with the hindsight that your study of history has given you, what do you think of the isolationists and pacifists? Were they, uh, were they stupid? Were they mm. ill-intended? Were they horribly naive? Um, um, what's your view? So... First of all, I, I, I'm not, um, uh, I don't believe in my own uh, abilities to forecast the future <laughs> enough that I could ever, uh, that I could imagine that they, that people like John Kennedy, John F. Kennedy was part of America First. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., this was somebody who had fought in, uh, in World War I and his father, uh, Teddy the Rough Rider, had said, mm -hmm. you, you know, this is our job. We have to go there and defend the small nation. That he, and that he who later became a Medal of Honor winner, that people like that, uh, that they should ever be um, uh, condemned. There are those like Charles mm -hmm. Lindbergh, whose views were highly racial um, and who, who uh, basically saw the world as uh, white people defending themselves against brown people, and that uh, this war in Europe was a war against cousins, and that's not our, our worry. The worry is, you know, these Asiatic hordes, and just throw the walls up and the war will stay away. Um, the, I think it's very, very hard to imagine anything except the costs of war. And if when you are faced with that, you say, hold it away, hold it away as best you can. And we came out of World War II with an understanding that it's not enough just to say, keep war away from my shores, that you have to care, have to maintain a sufficient force to act as a, a, a true deterrent. And that when uh, that when uh, extremist aggressors uh, are on the road to conquer other territories, <clears throat> that you have to do what you can to make sure that that price is so great that they will stop. One of the other uh, pacifists mm. was uh, Smedley Butler, mm. Marine Major General, two-time Medal of Honor recipient. Yeah. Died just after the fall of France, as I recall. Mm -hmm. So these were not lightweights, as you said. They, no. and, and I looked at the dictionary uh, definition of pacifist and it goes all the way from war in no circumstances to prefers peace. Well, of course. <laughs> and we're all pacifists, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, uh, but it was a complex time. Before we uh, log off the web session, do we have any more questions from the web? Yes, Spin sir. Uh, we have one. Uh, why did Japan choose December 7 for the attack and not December 1 or 2 for the 3rd? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so in Tokyo, the uh, initial expectation was actually at, uh, to have the attack take place at the end of November. Uh, the, uh, the decision to attack was made in uh, in September by the Imperial Council in Tokyo. Um, the, you know, we have not scratched the surface of what was going on in Japan. The, the weight of the extremists within the military ranks and their ability to control the civilian government uh, was... Uh, was basically what drove Japan into war. Uh, and we, of course, haven't talked about the embargo policies that, uh, that led the extremists to even contemplate the idea of going to war with the United States. And we haven't talked about the fact that the person who was the chief architect of that war was, uh, had lived in the United States mm 
and had uh, uh, been the, the naval attache in Washington, Yamamoto, and didn't believe that Japan could win a war against the United States. And yet they went to war and they attacked us because they believed that they, if they kicked us hard enough in the teeth, we mm. would back away. And we do have a history mm. of doing that, you know, uh, but the lesson of, of that war was if you get kicked in the teeth, you'd better, you'd better kick back really, really hard. Or are you going to pay a bigger price over time? Thanks. And we're going to end our Zoom session here. For those of you online, I'm sure you've enjoyed the discussion with Dr. Mark Wortman, the author of 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, and uh, read it. It's a great book. I, I will you. continue delving into it. And please come see us here on Historic Fort Island at America's Aviation Battlefield, uh, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. It's an amazing place, and there's so much more to see, learn, understand, and feel. And you can only do it here. So thanks for joining us online. We're going to stay with the lucky folks who are here in the house with us and answer some more questions. Aloha and mele kalekimaka. Aloha. Mahalo. <laughs>